Oh, praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Praise his name forevermore. Endless days we will sing of your praise. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You are our living hope. Worthy of every song we sing, of all the praise we could ever bring, of every breath we could ever breathe. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring the praise of your glory. You are raised to life again. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free. There is no one like you, none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, the name above every other name. Though I am weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I'll bring you more than a song. today for the first time or second time or many times. I am Pastor Roderick Santiago. I am the lead pastor of this incredible church, Mosaic Church. And uh, listen, we, we stand on four principles. There's one reason Mosaic exists, and, we, and this is the only reason. We exist to lead people to an authentic relationship with Christ to help them change the world. That's the one reason why we exist. We don't exist so that we can have good church. We don't exist so that we can just gather together and see our favorite people, even though that's one of my favorite things. We, we don't exist. Watch this. We do not exist, Mosaic Church. We don't exist just to serve the community. We exist at Mosaic Church to lead people to an authentic relationship with Christ so that we may help them change the world. We do that by helping people know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and then make a difference. And if you've been with me on prayer any of the, the, the five days of the week that I'm on here, you, if you bring my volume down a little bit, that ring will go away. Bring me down. I'll project. Hallelujah. I always say on our prayer, make somebody's life better. Come on, finish it. Y'all are so wonderful. I could tell who's been on prayer and who is not, but that's okay. <laughs> that was a test. Some of y'all passed. Some of y'all got a C minus. <laughs> Glory to God. I got educators in here. But that's why we exist, right? It's to make this world a better place, to, to leave this world better than how we found it. Amen? And that's what this is all about. So listen, if you're here today and you need prayer, uh, there's a connection card. You can fill that out. I'll make sure I add you to our prayer list. Uh, if you, if you want to join and you want to understand membership at Mosaic Church, fill out that connection card. I want to help you with that as well. There's a lot of fun things happening here at Mosaic Church, and there are a lot of brilliant ideas that are flowing, but we need some people to help us bring these things into fruition. So we need you all to, to jump in, jump on board, use your talents and your gifts to serve God. Amen. There's a story of a man who was lost in the desert, and he was weak from lack of water. He was literally dying of thirst. He stumbled upon a shack, and he went in to find shade from the blistering sun. He found a pump, grabbed the handle, and began to furiously pump up and down and up and down and up and down, and nothing came out of that pump. Disappointed, he staggered back, and he noticed an old bottle off to the side. And on the bottle, as he wiped the dirt and dust off, he read this label. It says, you have to prime the pump with water in this bottle. P.S., be sure to fill the bottle up again before you leave. So this man, very thirsty from water, being out in the desert, 
he popped the cork on the bottle, and surprise, sure enough, the bottle was full of water. Suddenly, the man was faced with a life-changing decision. I'm dying of thirst. There's water here in this bottle. I can drink it and sustain my life, or I can follow the instructions and pour the water on the pump to prime it and see what happens. Do I do, I, do, I do what I know I can do right now with this water and quench my thirst, or do I take a chance and believe that the instructions on the bottle are right? He decided, he thought about it, he thought about his two options. He could drink the water in the bottle and live, or he could pour it all out into the pump, hoping it would provide a generous supply for him to enjoy. Reluctantly, reluctantly, he poured the water into the pump. Then he grabbed that handle, and he began to pump. And a little, and, and, and squeak, ah, and another squeak, ah, and nothing came out. He continued to pump, ah, another squeak, ah, another squeak, ah, another squeak. And a little bit began to dribble, and he began to pump more. And then a small stream happened, and finally, finally, it gushed out. To his great relief, the water poured out. This cool water poured out from the pump. And then he, rent, he went and filled the bottle up and he drank from it. He filled it again and he drank its refreshing contents. Then he filled the bottle up for the next traveler. He filled it to the top. He stuck the cork back in and he added to this note. Believe me, it really works. You have to give it all away before you can get anything back. That's a lot of us. A lot of us are like this man. You see, we're not in the desert. We're in the world and we're thirsty. I like that the young people coin that term thirsty when you're looking for attention from sources that you think will quench your thirst. And they say you're thirsty when you dress a certain way and you dial yourself up a certain way and you go out looking for a man. They say, oh, you thirsty. Or, or if you're a guy and you're, 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 you're trying to meet a woman and you keep talking to a different woman and you keep pressing and you all up in her DMs, they say you're thirsty. They, 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 why do they say that? Because you're, quit, you're, you're thirsty for something that man can't give you. And many of us are in this world are like this man. We're not in the desert, but we're in the world and we're thirsty. And so we look to things other than God to worship. We worship what is popular in culture. We, we worship what is within reach. And it gives us a temporary joy, but it never satisfies your thirst. How do I know? Because you keep showing up. We are like this man, we're thirsty, but here's the problem. God gives us a bottle like he gave this man. And he says, you know what? You can either drink this bottle and quench your thirst right now, or you can prime it and then pump a little bit more, and you'll never be thirsty again. Can I show you all how that, what, how, how that illustrates in real life? You see, the water we drink is what God created. And he's saying, don't worship what I've created. Worship the one who created it. And we worship everything in the world, forgetting about the one who created the world. We worship everything within our reach instead of reaching for the one who can quench our thirst. And he says, he says here's, what, here's what I need you to do. I need you to prime your life with living water from a well that never runs dry. I need you to prime your life with me. In other words, <laughs> I need you to prime your life with praise and prayer. Prime your life with praise and prayer, not, not, not false stuff. In other words, I need you to give me a sacrificial worship. Up until this point, beloved, uh, in this series, we've talked about what worship is. But today I want to pivot because uh, we, we already know what worship is. It's, it's praise, it's singing, it's all. But today I want to pivot and tell you how we worship. 
See, sacrificial worship refers to the practice of worship, not what we do, but how we do it. Sacrificial worship refers to not what we do, but how we do it. And today, I'm hoping that I could help you with that. I want you, if you have your Bibles, meet me in the book of Romans chapter 12. Meet me in the book of Romans chapter 12. And I want to read the New Living Translation. I want to read verses 1 and 2. And this right here, beloved, is what sacrificial worship looks like. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, New Living Translation says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person. Well, how? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How do we offer to God a sacrifice? A sacrifice. How, how do we offer to God sacrificial worship? Our bodies. Now, I know some of us, you know, oftentimes this particular scripture is just connected to sexual immorality, but it's way deeper than that. Because what he's saying when he says, give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. What he's saying is, give your life, everything your body does, give that to God. Not just what you do morally or in, everything you do, your thinking, your coming, your going, your job, your education, your talents, your gifts, your finances, everything that your body does, give that to God. He said, if you want to make a sacrifice to me, give me all of you. Don't, don't just give me parts of you that you want me to have. No, give me all of it, the messy stuff and the good stuff. Give me all of it. Don't be selective with what you give me. I want all of it because I can do better with all of you than you can do with some of you. Give me all of you. Old Testament believers and followers of God, they went to a temple to worship God. And when they worshiped God at the temple, they always brought a sacrifice they, they, they always brought a sacrifice as part of their worship to God, whether it be lamb, whether it be an animal, whether it be gold, whether it be precious metals, whether it be incense. They always brought something to the temple uh, as part of their worship to God. But here it is, beloved, New Testament believers, that's you and I who call ourselves Christians. Not only do we go to the temple, the church, here it is, but we are the church and we are the sacrifice. So, so watch this. <laughs> Here it is. Let me make it plain. When we come into this building, which represents a New Testament temple, we are bringing the sacrifice, and the sacrifice is us. So, but here, here, here's the thing. God said, y'all don't have to bring me no goats. Y'all don't have to bring me no, no, no hens. Y'all don't have to bring me no gold. You don't have to bring me no silver. You don't have to bring, no, bring me you. Because I want you to be a sacrifice. I want you. You tell me to take the wheel, but you're still holding on to the other side. Bring me you. That's the sacrifice I want. Yeah, bring your tithe and bring your offering. But guess what? I want you. Because a lot of times, here's what happens. We bring our tithe and our offering, and it's, here it is. It's out of, out of religiosity, not out of faithfulness and gratitude to God. He said, bring me you. You want to impress me? Bring me you. Surrender to me. You want to impress me? You want to give me a, 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 you want to sacrifice something? Bring a surrendered version of yourself to you. I mean completely surrendered to me. In other words, the very first hour of the day belongs to me. The very first thought of your, of your, in your mind belongs to me. The very first ideas you have and you put on paper as a plan belong to me. The very first dollar you get into your bank account belongs to me. Surrender your life to me and that is pleasing worship to me. But this is how we do it. We have a plan and we invite God to the plan. 
God, I'm, I, I want to think of a plan. Help me think of a plan. Help me understand your plans for my life. You see, we make a decision and then we invite God in. We're doing it backwards. It's, God, what is the decision I should be making in this season? God, what is the direction I should be going in this season? God, what are the ideas that, that, that should be flowing through my head in this season? God, give me that. See, we, 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 we do something, then we ask God to bless it. God, I want to do this. Will you bless it? God is like, why don't you ask me first, and then you don't have to ask for the blessing, because when you ask me, I'm going to bless you with it anyway. You want to know what pleases God? All of us. We are. And here it is, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this. I love this. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his children. He said, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I tell people this all the time, and I may have even said it to some of y'all. Ready? Here it is. Like, as a Christian, I'm obligated to love every single one of you. But that don't mean I like all of y'all. I'm joking. I love and like all of y'all in this church. All right? But, there, but honestly, there, there, I mean, we are obligated to love everyone, but we don't have to like, and when I say don't like them, when we don't like their ways. Right? I don't have to like how you vote. I don't have to like uh, where you hang out. I don't have to like your lifestyle. But because you are God's creation, like I'm God's creation, I am obligated to love you. And if I want to be an imitator of God, I'm made in his image and likeness. But if I want to imitate him, I have to love beyond my preferences. And that's hard to do. But that's what Jesus did. Like, 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 like when he went and sp spoke with a Samaritan woman, like he, he went to a place that most Jewish people avoided. Like when he sat and had dinner with tax collectors who were considered worse than sinners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he ignored his preferences and loved those whom society refused to love. And that's how we imitate God. And doing that is an act of worship. It's a sacrificial act of worship. I say this all the time. At your job, can people look at you and tell that you're a Christian? Like without saying a word. I see these memes all the time that say, you know, tell me you're black without saying it. Y'all ever see these type of things? Or tell me you're this without saying it. Or tell me you're from Georgia without saying it. Or tell me you're Puerto Rican without saying it. You know, all these different memes, you know, y'all you, you, have seen them, right? And I often, and, and, and here's the thing I wonder, can people look at us, can, can, people, can you say I'm a Christian without saying it? Does your life look like Christ? Huh? Can, can, how, will, how do people know you're a Christian without you opening your mouth? Don't you dare say because I got the fish on the back of my car. Take that fish off if you don't look like Jesus. Or if you have that fish on there, put a word under there, go on fishing or something. But seriously, can people look at you without you saying and say, I know they're a Christian. I know they're a believer. I know they're this. I know they're that. Without you saying a single word. Because if they cannot, then you are not imitating Christ. Let me tell you how I know that. Back to Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Now, y'all know back in the day they didn't have TikTok. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have none of those social media things. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have iPhone and, and Android. They didn't have none of that with video cameras. But Jesus meets this woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, and just because of what she said, she's like, oh, you are Jesus. You are the Messiah. And you know what happened? Every time you went somewhere, because they didn't have social media, they didn't have all of these things, wherever you went, they could tell if you were part of the movement because, uh, called The Way, not just because of what you said, but because of how you acted. Because it was strange and unusual behavior for the times. But now, culture has influenced Christianity so much, <laughs> you can't tell us apart from the world. Because we are not doing strange and unusual things for the times that we're in. We are quiet Christians. And I was saying this the other, the other day uh, with my aunt who is here. She's finally here, y'all. My aunt Doris has moved here finally. Come on, give it up for her and my family. 
Now, I was saying this to her the other day. Sometimes we've gotten to a place where we want to just say what makes people feel good in the pulpit. We don't want to tell them, like, sin? Yeah, you can go to hell with sin. We don't want to say that, hey, you're sinning and you need to repent. We don't want to say that hell is a real place to people. We want to give this, just give good, feel good messages. Like, Jesus loves you. We got to love everybody. No, forget all of that. And I was saying to my aunt the other day, it's like, it's like if I love you, I'm going to save you, right? So you're driving and there's a cliff ahead of you. But you don't see the signs that there's a cliff ahead of you. And so if I know there's a cliff ahead of you that you're going to drive off of, what will I do? I will tell you, yo, slow down. There's a cliff ahead of you. The sign fell down. But I'm telling you because I know there's a cliff there. And if you don't stop right now, you're going to drive off that cliff and kill yourself. That's an act of love. But it's the same thing now with people's and people behavior. Like, if we don't tell you, yo, bruh, slow all the way down. You need to stop going to these places. You need to stop. Yo, sis, why are you entertaining that dude's calls? You know he means you know earthly good. Yo, you know you, 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 how you talking to your wife, bruh? That ain't right. You're sinning. It's not good. We don't do that anymore. Like, that ain't my business. Your friend be doing some, some crazy stuff sinfully. We don't say anything more. We don't say anything to him. Why? Because we don't want to offend people. And I'm not going to get into to, to, to certain communities that, that when we start talking about, oh, we got to be sensitive because I don't want to be what? Cancel. Cancel me. Cancel me today. But what you will not cancel is my Jesus. Because here's the thing. When Jesus encountered the woman at the well, Guess, guess what he did? Ooh, it's so good. He didn't, he called her out. He's like, listen, <laughs> you had several husbands, and the man you're living with right now ain't your husband. And she's like, oh, you, <laughs> you, you, you must be Jesus. Uh, <laughs> only people from this hood know that part of my life. He said, but let me, let me help you, sis. Let me give you a better alternative to this alternative lifestyle you're living. You see, he did it in love. You see, love tells people that you're going down the wrong path. And love gives them, watch this, watch this, a course correction to get on a better path. Love tells people, hey, and it's not judgment. And that's the problem with Christians. We quick to judge. We're judging. We're judging. We're judging. We're, we're trying to legislate morality. And it's like, that's so anti-gospel. That's opposite of what the gospel is. And the thing is, I, I, here it is, love says, though I don't agree with you, I accept you. You know why love says that? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't say, I, I'm going to die for everybody that accepts me first. There's a prayer he said, the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 16 or 17, where Jesus literally prays this prayer, this prayer. He says, I'm saying this prayer not only for my disciples, but I'm saying a prayer uh, of covering, of blessing, of protection, of bounty for not just those who follow me now, but for those who will someday believe me. He says, I'm laying it all out for those who don't even believe in me yet. Because love says, I don't have to agree with you, but I accept you as you are. But here it is. We're going to work to fix some things. Because Jesus accepted us as we are. None of us came to Jesus perfect. I thought I, thought I was in the right church. Because if that's you, you're in the wrong church. Because this is a church where no perfect people are allowed. We are all in need of a Savior. And he didn't say, get your life right before I give you salvation. He didn't say, uh, memorize the Bible front to back before I love you. He said, come as you are. Freedom is, is for you through salvation. Come as you are. But you can't stay that way. And that's what love says. Love says, come on as you are. And that's what we, to be imitators of God, <laughs> therefore, in everything we do, everything we do, Everything we do, we have to be imitators of God because a lot of, we have to live a life filled with love. It's not, an op it's not an option. Right? You don't get to say, today I want to do that, tomorrow I don't. Love forgives freely. Love forgives freely. Come on. Love forgives freely. Some of y'all holding on to grudges from, from middle school. Stop that. Some of y'all still mad at somebody from, for, for rejecting you. Stop that. 
Love forgives freely. Love may not forget, but it does forgive. God doesn't expect us to forget, but he does expect us to forgive whether we like it or not. That's what love does. And many of us, we need to do that. So let me, let me continue. I got off on a tangent. Our physical lives, beloved, our physical lives as a sacrifice is revealed through the spiritual sacrifices offered to God. Our physical lives as a sacrifice is revealed through the spiritual sacrifices that we offer to God. In the Old Testament, as I said earlier, they brought a sacrifice to the temple. But since, New, but since New Testament Christians give sacrifices from the temple, since the, we give sacrifices from the temple because the temple is us. So here it is. We don't have to bring a sacrifice. We give the sacrifice. We are the sacrifice. We don't have to come up to this church and bring a sacrifice. No, being the church, we give a sacrifice to God. We are the sacrifice. The Lamb of God, who was the sacrifice for us, he receives the reward of his suffering. Watch this. When we are activating and worshiping him in our spiritual sacrifices, through our spiritual sacrifices, the Lamb that was slain, receives the reward of his suffering when we are a living sacrifice on behalf of him. What do I mean the reward? Like, like literally, the, he's died for us. How do we reward him for his death for us? Here it is, by dying ourselves for him. And I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about sometimes you got to die in your mind and your thinking, and you've got to die to your, your traditional ways. You've got to die, here it is, to self-gratification. Because just like that man in the illustration at the beginning of this sermon uh, uh, was dealing with the dilemma, do I satisfy my needs or do I take a chance to satisfy my needs but then fill it back up to bless others? We're all struggling with that same dilemma in life. But we have to die to flesh. This is why the Bible tells us, pick up your cross on Sundays. Right? That's not what the Bible says. Pick up your cross on Wednesdays. No, no, no. Pick up your cross on the weekend. No, it says pick up your cross daily. And if you understand the, the purpose of the cross, the cross is not to be worn on your neck. <laughs> It's not a fancy charm that you wear on your gold rope. The cross represents death. The cross represents something dying. And scripture tells us, pick up this symbol of death every day. Why? Because every day there's stuff in your life you need to crucify in order as, as a sacrifice for God. So if I'm picking up my cross daily, the question is, what are you nailing to it? I see people wearing a cross on their neck every day. I'm like, oh, that's cute. That's cute. But what are you nailing to that cross that you're wearing on your neck? Because oftentimes you're wearing it just for bling. And if we're picking up our cross daily, that's an act of worship. That's saying, God, I know I'm not perfect, and I know I need a Savior, and so today I'm nailing my issues to the cross. I'm nailing my doubts to the cross. I'm nailing my fears to the cross. I'm nailing my, my arrogance, come on, to the cross. Some of us, that's me. <laughs> Maybe that's I'm all in that camp by myself. I will call some of y'all out, but I'm going to take it myself for you. What are you nailing to your cross daily? Because that is an act a sacrifice. And that is how, here it is, the one who hung up on the cross receives the reward for his suffering. When we nail our flesh to the cross. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I want to read the message version just to make it clear what it means to sacrifice our life for him. Here it is. The message version says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Can I say that again? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So here's what I want you to do. With God helping you, 
You see, the writer doesn't expect you to do this on your own. With God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life. What is that? You're sleeping, you're eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Everything. Take your everyday life. And, and give it to God as an offering. Everything. That's, this is the sacrifice he wants. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says this, New Living Translation. He says, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the, med- through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Can I, can I share with you why that's good news? Let me share with you why that's good news. Because prior to Jesus hanging up on that cross and giving his last breath, there used to be, watch this, a temple. And in that temple was what they call this wall, okay, that separated people from the Holy of Holies. Some people call it the veil. And so before Jesus gave his last breath, if you sinned, you had to go to the high priest who would atone for your sins once a year. And you had to tell him everything you've done that year. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did that. I did this, and this morning I was thinking that, and I almost said this, but then I said the other thing. But I, listen, I got a lot of sin. High priest, hook me up. Once a year. And then you go a whole year sinning again, trying to remember all the sin you committed. But Jesus says, I'm going to fix this and I'm going to fix it forever. When I give my last breath, the veil that separated people from this place called the Holy of Holies will be torn in half. Now the prayer field is level and all of us are now priests. That's what the Bible is saying. He said, you are a royal priest to the holy nation. He's talking about us. So no longer do you need the high priest to go to the temple and atone for your sins once a year. You can do that on your own because now you are the priesthood. You are the one that brings the sacrifice. No longer does the, does the priest have to come and bring a sacrifice or an offering. You are it. So when you sin, you could turn away from your own ways without having to even come to the pastor to repent and be forgiven. Because the prayer field is now level. Jesus says, I'm going to move man out of this and give access to man to this. Now you all can go right to God in the holy of holies. And here it is. And when we do that, we can make spiritual sacrifices that please God. So you may be asking, what are the spiritual sacrifices that please God, Pastor B? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to run through them uh, pretty fairly quick. One of the most important and easy spiritual sacrifices that we can make to God daily. Ready? Man, it's going to shock you what I'm going to say, Miss Miss Lynette. It's going to blow your mind. One of the easiest and most important sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices we can make to you put it up there before I said it. Y'all, y'all moving too fast. Y'all, y'all missing the cues. <laughs> there it is. It's prayer. <laughs> it's prayer. But the thing about Christians is that we don't do this often. You see, most of us, we pray when we need Jesus. And the thing is, that's the, that's the misnomer because here it is. You need Jesus every day before something goes wrong. But we pray when something is wrong or we're, or, or we're needed for a promotion. Or, no, 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 we need him every day. But this is not a common practice among Christians. I'm about to say something that might shock you. Hold on. Hold on tight. I did not learn how to pray as a Christian. I learned how to pray as a Muslim. It was through Islam that I learned the discipline of prayer. Because Islam requires you to pray five times a day toward Mecca. It's a part of your normal practice. And as a Sunni Muslim, before, after I was a 5 percenter, I became a Sunni Muslim. And I prayed five times a day. And I think it was toward Mecca. I just didn't geographically. I'm like, is Mecca this way or that way? I'm just going to pray to it when the sun rises. Okay, there it is, right? Five times a day, I learned the spiritual discipline of prayer, not as a Christian. And here's why. Because I didn't see Christians praying except for on Sunday or when they were in trouble. And people are seeing that in your life right now. Your children are seeing you pray only when you need Jesus because there's a dilemma or there's a crisis. Your friends are seeing you pray only when there's a dilemma or a crisis. Your workers are seeing you pray only when there's an issue. 
because prayer is an event for you, not your lifestyle. And that's an easy spiritual sacrifice that we ought to give. Prayer is a spiritual sacrifice. Watch this. Under the law, incense. Y'all know incense. I know some of y'all used to burn them and make your house smell pretty. But there's actual some religious uh, stuff behind it. There's some, some, some Christian stuff behind it. But under the law, incense were often associated with prayer. And incense were offered on the altar of incense in their tabernacle or in the temple. David, King David, prayed this prayer in Psalm 141.2. He said, may my prayer be set before you like incense. In the book of Revelation, John, the revelator, the one who, who gives these images, who saw these images, even in the book of Revelation, John sees this image of, 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 of these, these, these elders or whatever. They're bringing these, these watch this, these bowls of incense burning and these bowls of incense burning represented, according to the book of Revelation, these burning incense represented the prayers of the righteous ones. There's something wonderful about prayer and, 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 the, and, and in Old Testament, incense were brought to the altar of incense. Here's why this is so good. So that when we prayed, our prayers were a sweet aroma to God. And the incense never, never, ever were put out. They continue to burn. Why? To represent our continual prayer. Pray without ceasing. Pray and don't stop. Pray every day. Tell your father what you need. Prayer is supposed to be continual and all the time, and it is the easiest yet most neglected practice of the Christian today. And it's an easy, and, and here it is, prayer is an act of worship. I love being on prayer Monday through Friday, but just so you know, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m., that's not the only time I'm praying. Sometimes I don't realize I'm praying until I say amen, Mr. Mitchell. I'll be praying and it's like amen. I'm like, oh, I was just praying. I'll be in the gas station praying, praising. I mean, I just can't help with this because this is my lifestyle. It's not an event. It's not an event. This church exists not because we've earned a lot of money, not because we filled these seats. I don't ever recall a moment where every seat in this church or anywhere else we've had a service where every single seat was filled. But we have been around for over 12 years with a man who was a former Muslim leading this congregation. And you know what it was? It wasn't the money. It wasn't the influence. It was prayer. Because I said, I, I, if I can't do nothing else, Lord, I'm going to pray. If I can't preach, I'm going to pray. Help me, Lord, preach like Peter and pray like Paul. That was my message to myself daily, to preach like Peter and pray like Paul. I'm still working on the preaching part. I'll get there eventually. But prayer is a sacrifice. Let it be. Let our prayer, here it is. Think about it. Let me give you a vision. Let your daily prayer be a sweet aroma to the nostrils of a God who is the sacrifice for you and I. Let your prayer be part of the reward for his suffering. Prayer every single day, however you want to do it. Another spiritual sacrifice. Here it is, praise. <laughs> Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's not just something pastors say before they preach. That should be your daily mantra. Let the words of my mouth, meaning what I'm going to praise to you, and the meditations of my heart, meaning what's been stewing in my heart, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be pure and acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let my praise be authentic. Let it, let it be beautiful to you. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear. And here's the thing. We praise only when he responds. I knew I was, it was going to be quiet. I knew it was going to be quiet on that part, Jasmine. Because a lot of people, because yeah, I'm, I'm speaking truth. We praise only when he responds. 
Only when, only when we get what we've asked for, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But, but we're not praying while we're in the waiting room. We're not praying. God, I thank you. I know you have not responded yet, but though I cannot track you, I still trust you. I stand firm and flat-footed in this position until I hear from you. Thank you, Lord, for I am fearful and wonderfully made. Thank you, Lord, for providing all of my needs according to your riches and glory in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for making me your image and your lightness. Thank you, Lord, for making me a little bit lower than the angels. Thank you, Lord, for providing all of my needs. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of my sins and wiping your mind clear. Thank you, Lord. There should be a praise on your spirit every single day. Thank you for my house. Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my car. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for the air that I breathe, even though it's polluted. God, I thank you. We only thank him when he responds to our prayer needs. He says there should be a constant praise. Hebrews chapter 12, 28 through 29. Since we are receiving, ooh, this is so good. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. We are receiving a kingdom that Jesus said, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable. Let us be thankful and please God, how? By worshiping him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire, but other scriptures will say a consuming fire. You know why that's good? Come on, Pastor B, help him out this morning. Because here it is, when we're worshiping, the fire of God consumes and burns off the stuff that get in the way of our worship. When we're giving him our all, his consuming fire burns away the, the stuff that's getting in the way of our pure and authentic worship to him. He burns off the mess of the world. He burns off the whiskers of our worry. He burns off the, 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 the messiness of the stuff that's on us. When we are consumed in worship to God, he is a consuming fire that's shedding off the stuff and burning off the stuff. That's blocking our praise to him. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus Christ a continual sacrifice of praise to God. Proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Okay, I think that part was for stingy people. <laughs> people, here it is. It says, don't forget, it's like a reminder, hold on, let me remind you, I want you to do good, but I also want you to share with those in need. Share with those in need. What happens is a lot of times we don't do that because we assume somebody else is going to do it. Oh, they got that. Oh, you got that. So-and-so got that. And we don't let... <laughs> we, 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 don't, we, 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 we make decisions based upon thinking somebody else is going to do something when we need to be the ones to do it. And if they have more than they need, amen. That's biblical. That's biblical. Number three, another spiritual sacrifice, ready, is a surrendered will. A surrendered will. A surrendered will is an act of worship when we willingly crucify ourselves and embrace surrender to the will of God. When we choose his way rather than our own, that is an act of worship. And a beautiful thing about I love scripture is as Christians, we're followers of Christ, so we imitate Christ. We try to do what Christ did. You know, even Jesus had a moment where he struggled with the will of God. Y'all don't remember when he was in the garden and uh, he was there and he's about to face some very painful moments. And he says, God, if you can remove this cup of suffering, I mean, if there's another way we can do this, I'll take that. But then he pivots and he says, but you know what? If this is the only way you can do it, not my will, but your will. And some of us, ooh, come on, we're like that. God, if you could remove this suffering, if you could remove this pain from my heart, 
I will serve you. If there's another way that you can get me to my destiny, I will take that instead. But God says, no, I didn't sentence you to suffering. I trusted you with it. You see, I know how much you can bear. I know how much you can handle. No, I didn't sentence you to punishment. I trusted you with it because this is going to build something in you that you didn't realize needed to be built. He said, he said, he said, he said, surrender your will to bow out because it's uncomfortable. Come on. I just got up in somebody. Been. Surrender your will to say, I quit. This don't feel good. This don't look good. I'm looking at the clock. I'm, you know what? I've had enough. I'm out. Surrender your will to bow out prematurely before the blessing comes. You are one season away from receiving what God has in store from you. You are one prayer away from receiving what God has in store from you. You are one praise away from receiving what God has in store for you. Don't you dare quit. Surrender your will to his will. For Paul reminds us, when I'm weak, therefore I'm strong. Because I'm not operating in my natural strength, I'm, I'm operating in my spiritual strength, and that is the strength of the Lord. And we only operate in that sense when we surrender our will to him. I, I have plans, but God, I'd rather follow yours. Surrender, a surrendered will is an act of worship. Here's another one. A spiritual sacrifice, here it is. Time is an act of worship. Time is an act of worship. You see, when we give the best of our time, and let me fix this because some of y'all are already getting uncomfortable. When we give the best of our time, not the most of our time, to God, it is an act of worship. Now, I, I hear people say, I'm at church all the time. I need some time. From God, God, listen, the same way God, God gives us what? When he gives us stewardship over his money, because that's what it is. He doesn't say, give me 90, and I want you to live off of 10. God is such a good God. He says, trust me with just 10% of what I've given you. And he says the same thing with your time. I've given you 24 hours in a day. I've given you uh, 365 days this year. I'm not asking for most of it. I'm just asking for the best of it. And the best of it is not, not, not measured by the amount, but is measured by the quality. So if the best of your day begins in the morning, God says, give me that first. I want the first of your day. I want the, I want the, the part of your day where you have the greatest energy. Because when you have the greatest energy, we have the greatest conversations. When you have the greatest energy, we have the greatest interaction. When you have optimal energy, we have optimal engagement. Give me the best hour of your day. When I have your undivided attention, you're not thinking about dinner later on. You're not thinking about the kids. You're not. Give me the best part of your day. I don't want all of your time, but I want the best part of your time. That's what God says. That's something you got to think about. Because now y'all like, oh, dang, that's... That's different, Pastor B, the best part. When am I most energized? Because that's the best part. When you are most energized and when you're most focused. If you, here it is. <laughs> I want to fix this. If you pray and praise only at night, I don't think you're giving God your best. You're tired. You've dealt with people. You've dealt with stuff. You've dealt with your children. You've dealt with your coworkers. And at the end of the day, you're going to call yourself trying to praise. Before you know it, you done fell asleep. And God looking at you like, I was so waiting for us to get together and look at you falling asleep. It's like, like when my wife and I plan for quality time and, and she's excited and I get to watch some of her favorite programs with her. And she's been waiting for this day. And then we sit down together to watch one of her programs. And I'm like this. And she's like, wake up. I'm like, oh, man, I let her down. And that's what we do to God. He's like, I've been waiting for us to talk all day. Now you're too tired to talk to me. Now you're too tired to give me an authentic engagement. Now you're too tired to, to commune and fellowship with me. This is why he says, give me the best of your time. I don't need the most of your time, but I do need the best of your time. Because here it is. It's the best part. Y'all ready? He wants the best of your time for your sake. Because when you are rested well, when you are focused, you can hear God better. He says, I want you to give me the best of your time, not for me, 
but for you. I've got something for you. But if you're not rested, if you're tired, if you're distracted, guess what? You're going to miss what I'm trying to give you, and you're going to think that I didn't show up, and I was there the whole time. He says, I don't want all of your time. I just need the best of your time. Another spiritual sacrifice, here it is, talent. 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, all tells us that he gives us gifts, spiritual gifts, and, and he gives us these talents. And here's what happens. We use our spiritual gifts and we use our talents to, pro, to profit. And the beauty is God is like, cool, that's good. But how much of what I've given you are you giving back to build up what I've created to change the world, which is my church? I'm glad that you're using your spiritual gifts to, to earn a profit. That's cool. That's why that's part. That's a small part of why I've given you these gifts. That's a small part of why I've given you these talents. But the real reason I've given you that, according to 1 Corinthians and according to Ephesians, I've given you these spiritual talents and I've given you these gifts. Why? To help build the kingdom on earth. To help build others up. you got all of this gifting and you're making all of this money, but are you serving? or even giving to your church. Amen, lights. He says, I've given you gifts and talents. Yeah, earn an income. That's part of it. But that's not the whole of it. I've given you this to build up my kingdom. And I expect you as a spiritual sacrifice. Give me your talent. And here it is. I want the best of it. I want the best of it. Those ideas I gave you were not just to profit, but to help build the kingdom. I didn't make you as smart as I made you. I didn't make you as creative as I made you for you to go out there and just make a whole bunch of money, but your church is suffering. Some of y'all are sitting on ideas that you're looking at profiting in the world, and God says, take that idea, let's use it in the church, and let's intersect with every single one of the mountains of influence, entertainment, music, athletics, and sports, uh, business. Business, government, use your talents and gift in the church and let's infiltrate the entire system. I went too deep, Marv. I'm sorry. I went too because they're like seven mountains of influence. Okay, wait, what? What are you talking about? Okay, I'll, I'll school y'all on that another day. I, I do want to give it to you now, but you know, some people are nodding like they understand the seven mountains of influence. We'll get into that another day, right? Right, sis? Like, she like, yeah, I understand. But seriously. Take your talents and start here, and then let's go out there. Take your talents and gift, let's start in here. Because this was the only plan God had. God didn't give us talents and gift and say, now I want y'all to go, and I want you to become elected officials, and then I want you to put laws into place so that we can govern the land. I want you to go and become an elected official so that we can take care of the poor and the needy. He said, no, I'll give you talents and gifts, and the church is going to be the thing that changes the world. So start here in the church with your talents and your gifts. That's a sacrificial spiritual worship. Number six, ready? He said, uh, <laughs> generosity. Generosity, here it is, it is indeed a spiritual sacrifice. How do I know? Well, let's go back to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 all the way down to 47. Like they, there was this new movement called the way and everybody gave to it sacrificially. It wasn't about, you know, I don't know you. I ain't giving you my money. I don't know you. I ain't selling my, I don't even know you to give you my stuff. It wasn't about that. When the church was born, in the, book of chap in the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, they did several things. They met together at the temple every day. They met in each other's homes and, and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching every day. They, they shared everything they had so that nobody lacked anything every day. Here it is. And then to make sure that everybody got a piece of the pie, those who had possessions sold them so that nobody missed out. The church was born generous, but has become stingy. The church was created in a spirit of generosity, but we have forgotten all about it. 
And we'll be like that church that they mention in the book of Revelation, the church that has lost its first love. And I would say many churches have lost their first love, which is generosity. That's what the church was born on. And that, beloved, is an act of when we are generous. Here it is. And I'm not saying give more to the Salvation Army or your local charity than you give to your church. But what I am saying is when we are generous, that is an act of worship. We are worshiping God. And I tell people, it trips me out. A lot of pastors do this. And somebody said we should do this. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. There's churches that do annually what they call acts of kindness, random acts of kindness. And they say, hey, if you're at Starbucks, pay for somebody's Starbucks drink and then give them the church card. People don't want no bait and switch. They don't want no gimmicks. Hey, if you're, if you're at Chick-fil-A and somebody's behind you, pay for theirs and then give them the card and then tell them, hey, can you give that to them and let them know I pay for the lunch? I wish, listen, if I wasn't a Christian and somebody did that for me, I'd be like, thank you for lunch. What's this? Anyway, thank you for the lunch. I appreciate you. I'm throwing that card out. You done wasted your money on this paper you printed. Don't do no bait and switch. How about this? How about you just do it and keep it moving? Because God didn't tell us to go out there and fill our churches with a whole bunch of people that are not discipled. He said, go out into the world and disciple others. He said, take care of those who are in need. I don't need to give you my church car, buy you Chick-fil-A and then give you my church car. Here it is. Ready? If I'm acting like Jesus and I'm loving like Jesus and I'm always filled with a certain disposition, people are going to ask about my church. I don't have to force it. If I'm just loving like Jesus and living like Jesus and just, just being kind to people, people are going to ask. So why don't we just do good? Why don't we just be good and then just let it happen organically? Because is that not what the early church did? They wouldn't, okay, I'm going I'm to sell my possessions, but here, give them my church car. Tell them to scan the QR code. Service starts at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and they can watch us online. No, they didn't do that. They just did it. And it was so powerful. People were like, that is dope. I want to be a part of that. Where do I sign up? How do I know? Because not only were there people, <laughs> remember the rich young lad? He was like, yo, I'm, I'm hearing about this movement called The Way. This thing is on fire. Yo, how can I be a part of this movement called The Way? And Jesus was like, oh, it's simple. <laughs> it's simple. Hey, here, here's what you got to do. Sell all of your possessions. And the rich dude was like, huh? Uh, I don't think I heard you right, Jesus. So speak to this ear. That This ear is kind of weak. What would you say now? Uh, sell all of your possessions. And here's a part I didn't say. And give it to the poor. Bible says that rich dude was like, deuces. Deuces, I'm out. You want me to part? You don't know. You 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 don't know what it took to get this stuff. That's what he wants us to do. Just do it. Because if you're doing it right, people are gonna want to be a part of what you got going on. I don't have to give you a card and do a bait and switch. Let me buy your Chick Fil A. But hey, come check us out on Sunday. Get out of here with that. Miss me with that. Miss me with that. Just do it because God expects it. So here it is. When we pray, when we praise, when we surrender our will, when we make God a priority with our schedules, when we use our talents to benefit God and his kingdom, when we give generously to the church and to those in need, we are then and only then worshiping God sacrificially. When we're doing those things, then and only then are we worshiping sacrificially. If you come to church and just sing the songs, you, you sing it, but you're not worshiping sacrificially. A sacrifice requires giving something away. A sacrifice requires giving something away. And what God wants us to give away is us to him and the world that needs us. Amen? Amen.